Well, welcome to this edition of Demo Forum. We're pleased to have all of you here, and of course our special guest today, which, we'll, uh, which I will be introducing in just a moment. Let me uh, point out a couple of people that are stalwarts in terms of making these things happen on a regular basis. Uh, we have the Marion County, uh, the chair of the Marion County Democrats, uh, Rick Hardwick over here. Rick. <laughs> Pat Williams, the secretary of Marion County Democrats over here. Wanda Davis, is Wanda here? There she is back there. Okay, Wanda Davis, Polk County Democrats. Uh, Bob Esterbrook is Brad Avakian's senior staff member. Is Bob here? Back in the back there. Uh, Lindsey Perry, Claudia uh, Kyle's campaign manager. How's this year? I didn't see Lindsey. Okay, she may be a little late. And our videographer, Raymond Dukes, the owner of Video uh, Big Picture Productions, rather. And we have our stalwarts that are always... Uh, Always uh, here to uh, take your reservations, Leanne Broman, uh, Kasia Quillenden, and Dave Engen. A round of applause there. And uh, greeters, uh, they're the greeters. We have uh, Steve Kinney usually on the microphone back there, Steve. And uh, Roger Kay has done yeoman work in terms of taking the uh, coupons and making sure that the number of coupons equal the number of lunches that we have. A round of applause for Roger Cave, right back there. Well, today's guest is uh, uh, no stranger to anybody uh, here, I suspect, because it's uh, Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian, who happens to be uh, a guest on a number of occasions here at Demo Forum, and we've had the pleasure of uh, Brad's company on other occasions. But it's always good to renew our acquaintanceship with the commissioner and also to introduce him to new members and to uh, people at home that may not have uh, had the opportunity to hear about the story that's behind the uh, commissioner. <clears throat> commissioner uh, Avaki was born in Fresno, California, uh, but raised in Washington County, Oregon, let me quick to add, where he went to school, met his wife Debbie, and raised a family. So he's really committed to, Oregon, to Washington County. Um, and the state of Oregon. Uh, Brad has, been an un has an undergraduate degree in psychology from Oregon State University and a law degree from the Lewis and Clark Law School. Brad worked as a civil rights attorney and he also has the distinction of co-founding the Washington County chapter of the League of Conservation Voters. And you're gonna see that he has a great interest in environmental issues. Uh, Brad serves also as the honorary chair of the Oregon Business Leaders Network, uh, which I think is really interesting. It's a coalition of employers that uh, have committed to hiring uh, the disabled. So I believe that is, is a really interesting facet of his career. Brad has served us in both the House, the Oregon House and, and Senate. In 2002, he's elected to House District 34, which is the Portland West Side area. And in 2006, he was elected to the Oregon Senate, representing Senate, Senate District 17. Um, while in the uh, legislature, Commissioner Avakian was uh, honored by the AFL-CIO and the SEIU Local 503 for his work on behalf of working families, which I know is a subject that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, Brad also chaired the Environment and Natural Resources Committee in the legislature <coughs> and was a leader in passing an extension of the bottle bill as well as a Renewable Energy Act. Um, Commissioner Avakian was appointed by Governor Kulongoski to Labor Commissioner when then Commissioner Dan Gardner uh, resigned to take another position, and then uh, Brad won special election in the November 2008 term for four, or 2008 election uh, for a four-year term. Commissioner Brad Avakian has worked tirelessly uh, on behalf of uh, apprenticeship programs, apprenticeship training, uh, workforce development, workers' rights and wages, uh, the, the effort to return, and this is, I think, a really important issue, too, the effort to return technical education to our public schools, something that has been neglected, I think, too, uh, too long and, and for too uh, long a period of time. But he's also been uh, involved with creating a 21st century workforce, which he hopes will lead this nation uh, in the field of clean energy. Please join with me in welcoming Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian back to Demo Forum. Well, that was awful nice of you, Mike, and so thorough. I'd just say, anybody got any questions? We'll just move right to that. No, I really appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. And, and I appreciate you having me down again. I have been down to the demo forum in 
the last few years several times, and I just look forward to it so much. There's just, I mean, you've got a great county party down here anyway, but the demo forum, you know, is just something a little bit unique. And I just think it's, I just think it's terrific. So thanks again um, for inviting me down one more time. And I thought what I might do is this. Um, I, I know you always have lots of questions, so I'm going to leave lots of time for questions so we can just have a discussion at the end. But because uh, you might want to, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the Bureau a little bit and, and uh, a few things that we have going on there that I want to continue into my next term should I win the election. But you might want to talk about the election season. You might want to know what's going on with my campaign. You might have other things you want to talk about. So we'll just, uh, we'll leave plenty of time for that. But let's, let's start with this. I want to, um, like I did last time, just give you a quick tutorial on the Bureau of Labor and Industries so that you, you know exactly what we do. How many people here think they know what the Bureau of Labor of Industries does? Oh, look, almost every hand comes up. So you know we do, for instance, um, workers' compensation. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. You know if there is a dispute between a, a union and a, a business on a labor agreement that we're the ones that arbitrates the dispute. No, we don't do that either. So I'll give you a quick tutorial. I'll give you a quick tutorial on, on work or on work on what we do, and um, and then talk a couple about a couple of the things we're working on. I think you'll be very interested in. Um, as your as your uh, commissioner of labor and industries, you know I'm one of our five statewide elected officials, along with the governor, secretary of state, treasurer, um, attorney general, and the commissioner of of labor and industries, and my my job as your commissioner is to lead the state's Bureau of Labor and Industries, and we do primarily four different things, all right? And, and two of those are on a side that works hand-in-hand -hand with employers, and two of those are on an enforcement side. On the side that works hand-in-hand -hand with Oregon businesses, we have the State Apprenticeship and Training Division, uh, which, has a, which, which um, gives us a very large hand in the state's workforce development system. We certify the state's apprenticeship facilities. Most of them are training great workers in the construction trades. Uh, we've uh, trained and put to work more than 6,000 people since I became uh, commissioner a few years ago. Uh, and we have on that side of the agency the state's technical assistance program. And this is a, a terrific program where if you're a business, you can call us and confidentially and for free ask us questions about how to navigate your way through the very complicated state and federal employment laws. So it is a great resource for businesses around the state. We get over 15,000 calls a year from businesses looking for some guidance. And it's also the best way for us to make sure that bad things don't happen on the job that end up on the enforcement side later. Uh, we also uh, do roughly 200 seminars around the state in all four corners of the state helping to teach businesses how to comply uh, with the law and if any of you are business owners you might even have our um, our posters up in 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 in, uh, in your office or have our wage and hour or civil rights handbooks that are great resources so all of that is in the technical assistance program the other side of the agency is the enforcement side of the agency when things don't go right on the job. We have the state's uh, wage and hour division, so we make sure that people get paid the wages that they actually worked for. So we enforce the state's minimum wage law. We enforce the state's prevailing wage law, which you know are the wages that I set for workers to be paid on public projects, like building buildings and roads and bridges and so on. Um, uh, and we make sure that people are getting their meal and rest periods on time. That part of the agency also has the state's farm worker uh, unit, so we make sure that farm workers are being protected and, uh, and also that make sure that uh, young people, children that are working on the job are protected. So wage an hour, and then also the Civil Rights Division. We are the state's chief law enforcement agency for protecting people's civil rights in Oregon, uh, and not just on the job. We also do the state and federal housing investigations and any discrimination that occurs in a public place, people turned away from a restaurant or a bowling alley or a store, uh, those places of public accommodation. 
we enforce the civil rights laws in all of those uh, areas. And just to give you an idea of the volume of work that that encompasses, between wage and hour and civil rights, we investigate roughly 5,000 cases a year. Uh, and uh, that, that sometimes settle and sometimes progress to a hearing. Since I became labor commissioner, that amounts to over $13 million that we've put back into the pockets of people that have been treated unfairly in Oregon. And the last thing I want to mention just about the Bureau, to give you an idea, because we're doing some new things too since I got there. One of them is, um, in addition to uh, uh, hearing um, disputes that arise between a person and a business or a person and a landlord through that Civil Rights and Wage and Hour Division, I wanted the agency to start taking a bigger role in actually charting the course for the progress of civil rights in Oregon. And so a couple years ago, I created the Oregon Council on Civil Rights, which works closely with our Bureau to help chart the course for the, for the futures. We get ahead, uh, ahead of the curve on some civil rights issues before they become disputes within the agency. Um, and so that's what we do. And I mentioned that one last because it leads right into one of the things that we are working on now that I want to continue into my next term should I win. One of, uh, one of the great civil rights injustices that continues to occur in Oregon like it does in every state in the country, equal pay for equal work. You know, in Oregon today, women earn 77 cents on the dollar compared to their male counterparts. Minorities earn 60 cents on the dollar compared to their white male counterparts on the job. And if you're a minority woman, you earn even less money than that in 2012 Oregon. Uh, so the first task that I have given the Council on Civil Rights is to create an action plan for the state that won't just decrease wage disparity, but that will end wage disparity in Oregon. They, they have taken it to heart. They'll be coming back by the end of the year with a plan that, we'll be, that we will be rolling out. And one of the things that I just think is tremendous about the work they're doing uh, is those of you who have followed this issue, which has existed forever in this country, knows that there's very little data on which to uh, create any kind of a plan. There just aren't very many studies out there about what the disparity is or why it exists, especially relative to minorities. So what we've d taken it upon ourselves um, in coordination with the Commission on Women uh, is we are using the U.S. Census data, which has just a breadth of information about what jobs people are working and how much they earn, all s based on demographics of gender, race, and religion, and all the protected classes. Well, we're pulling all that together, and we're going to create our own study using the U.S. Census data. It'll be the most current study on wage disparity anywhere in the country. And by the end of the year, we'll be putting out a terrific new set of information on which to base our action plan. And we'll, of course, be sharing that with other states and the federal government, because I think it's going to be uh, really the gold standard for how to attack wage disparity. Uh, so that is the first. The second I want to mention is this, and I talked to you about it last time, but there's, there's, I was here, but there's an update I want to give you. Um, uh, the crisis we have in our workforce with respect to the age of our workforce. Uh, uh, you know the folks working in our construction trades are in the late 40s to early 50s. Um, I went and spoke to a group of nurses, and they said, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. Take a look at how old the nurses are in Oregon. And they're experiencing the same exact thing. Well, you know, we studied why it was that, that, that this was occurring here. And, and you know the, the results were, as I told you last time, those ages began to spike at the very time we began eliminating our shop classes from our middle schools and high schools. The average age of an apprentice 
was 19 years old, if you go back a little over a decade. Today it's 26 in Oregon. Because we're not providing pathways to people when they're young and they get out of high school and they bounce around, they get into a community college when they're 25 years old and, or a training program of some sort, and so the, rate, the ages are rising. So uh, in 2011, I pulled together the business community with the labor unions, uh, two groups you don't always see walking hand in hand together through the state capitol. We brought in professional educators from the state. We brought a bill to the legislature to see the restoration of 21st century shop classes back to our middle schools and high schools. No, it gets better. It gets better. Um, and, and this won't just be the old wood shop and metal shop, you know, it'll be that. But I'm talking about 21st century skills like emerging healthcare industries. How do you build and design a solar panel? I even called uh, the Arts and Communication School, a magnet school, public school in Beaverton that specializes in music and art, and said, what I want to see from you is a grant application to uh, create uh, a program, a pre-apprenticeship program with your orchestra in conjunction with the Oregon Symphony that will provide pathways for kids who want to have a profession in music and art. So I'm talking a wide variety of things that we can provide for our kids. And here's where your applause comes in. That bill, <laughs> that bill passed through the Oregon House and the Oregon Senate with every single Democrat and every single Republican that voted on the bill voting yes. With, with, by the way, brand new money for public education. Not a reshuffling of the money that they've already got, but brand new money for public schools um, in, with Susan Castillo and I, our state school superintendent, we have the authority to appoint the group that hands out the grants. We've done that. They've gone through uh, the, the huge amount of applications that came pouring in. And this month, you will actually see the grants being handed out that are going to return the programs to our public schools. I just think it's a great thing. So the trick now for us is this is only the first round. Um, I wish I could tell you all the schools that are getting the grants, but we, we can't do that until uh, at least the end of the month because of, uh, there's a process for people appealing that didn't get grants. But I wish I could tell you who they were because it's very exciting, but I will be able to very soon. But this is only the first round in what is a 10-year plan as we restore money to the grant every budget cycle until we get a presence in every middle school and high school in the state again. So very excited about that. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is, is, is this, and then I'm going to stop and we'll see, we'll see what you want to talk about. And this thing I want to bring up now is, is, uh, is an interactive topic. I want to know what you think about it, in addition to me telling you what I think and what I've, what I've done. You're actually going to help me plan out a little bit of uh, policy making and agenda for the Bureau of Labor here. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. One of the other areas um, uh, regarding uh, what the Bureau does um, and also regarding providing pathways for our young people has to do with children that work in agriculture in Oregon. Part of my job as your Labor Commissioner is to make sure that young people, when they work on the job, are safe. And we have a terrific process at the Bureau for doing it. You know, there's all kinds of restrictions around what young people can do because we want them to be safe. Uh, there are stiff penalties. We handed one out last month if an employer violates those laws and puts a young person at risk. And in some industries where traditionally young people have worked, there's a method to ask for a waiver from the commissioner so that I can actually look at what the young person is going to be doing, the precautions that the employer is taking, and then I can make a decision on whether or not this benefits the employer and the worker and that the proper precautions have been met, and I can issue a waiver allowing the young person to work. And that is tremendously helpful in getting young people to work and to work safely. Um, some of these young people need to do it to earn money for their families. And in some cases, it just gets them started on a great pathway for themselves, if it's managed well. 
One place where it's really important to manage it well is in agriculture. You know, Oregon has a real tradition of having young people work on our farms and ranches. Um, people grow up in the culture of Oregon. You know, I was one that did when I was young. I think I worked every berry field in Washington County and half the, the hazelnut orchards in Yamhill County when I was young. A lot of you remember, you'd get up early, you'd pedal your bike down there, or you'd go to the bus stop and the bus would pick you all up and take you down. And I gotta tell you, it taught me not just a little bit about responsibility, it taught me an awful lot about the land and the water and the culture of Oregon. And I wanna make sure that our young people still have the opportunity to have that kind of an experience not to mention the fact that our farms and ranches are still very dependent on a young workforce to be able to get crops out of the field when they need to be taken out of the field. So I'm careful when I issue waivers and we apply the agricultural laws to make sure kids are safe, but to also make sure those opportunities exist. In the last year, um, the federal government has issued proposed new rules for child workers in agriculture that will virtually eliminate the ability of 14 and 15 year olds to work on Oregon's ranches and farms anymore. Now one of the ways that we keep them so safe in Oregon is because uh, kids have to use certain types of machinery when they're on the farm. They have to work with livestock and so we have terrific FFA programs, vocational agricultural programs and 4-H programs that actually have certification methods where they'll teach a kid how you use a piece of machinery or how you drive a tractor and they become certified and in the past that certification has enabled kids to have these experiences on our ranches and farms the new federal regulations will no longer recognize Oregon's VOCAG 4-H and um, uh, FFA certification programs it will also preclude things like anybody under the age of 16 working at a height above six feet. No ladders, no climbing up to the hayloft, no sitting in the combine anymore because you can't work over six feet. It also precludes things like uh, collecting uh, livestock for market, including chickens. No, no 15 year old can run around and grab the chickens up to stick them in the pen to take them to market. You can't assist in any animal husbandry. You can't assist with the birthing uh, of a foal or a calf. And so it really strips young people out of those, out of those uh, um, activities. Uh, so I, I've made the decision to oppose most of the new federal regulations. I've written a letter to uh, the administration uh, explaining to them the terrific history Oregon has in protecting its kids at work uh, on ag in agricultural settings and ask them to exempt Oregon from these regulations if they even pass them. I want them to rethink where they're headed. Okay. Well, evidently you like that, but I really wanted to have your input on the thing too. Um, so when we get to question and answer, I want you to feel free to, to bring this up. Because it's, it's an important issue. I take so seriously the protection of our children. Um, in Oregon, uh, only 0.7% of the thousands of kids we have working in agriculture are injured each year. That equates to an average of 14 injuries a year. The injury rate for adults in agriculture is more than twice as high which to me shows what a great job we do of protecting our kids. But because it is an important issue, the balance of protecting young people with providing opportunities, when we do some question and answer, feel free to tell me what you think about it, will you? All right. Um, let me just say one more time, thanks so much for having me down again. I love coming down and talking with you. Um, if you reelect me to come back as your labor commissioner, you can count on a couple things. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, seeing equal pay for equal work through to the end and equalizing wage disparity in Oregon. And the other is going to be uh, never, ever letting up until every middle school and every high school in this state has got a career education program again. Now, let's see what you all might want to talk about. Yeah.
No, Steve, go right ahead. You want to ask? As a result of all the servicemen and women coming back from the, from the uh, board, uh, what are you seeing as far as when you served your country and you left your, you left your establishment where you were working, weren't you entitled to have your job back? We, we do enforce the laws that protect um, servicemen and women when, when they return, and they do need to be accommodated. Uh, there's a balancing test between the needs of the employer and the needs of the returning service member. But yes, there is a law, it is a civil right to not be discriminated against because of, um, uh, of your service. Uh, and we, en we enforce the law, um, you know, strictly. Uh, the, the trick sometimes is making sure that returning service members, if they're not treated fairly, trust the government enough to give you a call and say, I need some help. And so we have set up a whole uh, new system with the Oregon Veterans um, Department so that when either one of our agencies is contacted by somebody in need, we're communicating with each other to make sure they get all the services that they need. And the one thing I want to add to that, which I think was a terrific bill passed in the 2009 legislative session, protects not just the service members, but spouses of service members. Um, you know, I've had a couple calls before that law was passed, one in particular from a, uh, a woman who, um, a, 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 a young wife, her husband, was being sent over, it was either Afghanistan or Iraq, I think it was Afghanistan, and they had a new baby at home. And she wanted, like you would naturally think, to have a little bit of time together with her and her husband and the baby before he was sent off to this war zone. And so she went to the employer and said, he's leaving, can I have a few days off that we can have together? And, you know, we have tremendous employers in Oregon. 99.9% uh, .9 of them would have said, absolutely. But you know what happened. They said no which put this young mom in the terrible position of either not having the time together as a family or potentially losing the job at a time when that family was dependent on the income. And I had to tell her there is no law that protects you here. But she called me back a few weeks later and said, just wanted you to know I decided to go back to work. We didn't get that time together as a family. But she made the decision she had to make. The legislature passed a great law that said you also cannot, you have to reasonably accommodate the needs of spouses of military personnel when they're being deployed and when they're being returning and transitioning back. It was a terrific law. Sure. Um, yes, it was unique, wasn't it? Yes. Um, back when I was appointed four years ago, um, the, there were six statewide elected officials. You know, we don't have the state school superintendent as an elected position a anymore, but there were six of us, and we rotated three being elected one cycle, three the next, so you don't clean out your whole state government at once. Well, I was uh, appointed and then elected in the special election mid-term of the Commissioner of Labor and Industries term, which set us from 3-3 to 2-4. And so um, there were uh, a number of us that thought we ought to at some point make the Labor Commissioner run twice in a row, it's a four-year term, make him at only a two-year term, run twice in a row, to even it back out at 3-3 three and three again. And I felt strongly at, at the time that law was passed in 2009, we ought to even it out like 15 years from now so none of the current political players were involved in the decision. The legislature chose to have me run this year, 2012, and also in 2014 to do it now, which is fine. Um, in that law, making me run twice in a row this time, Inadvertently, the date for this year's election for labor commissioner was stated as November, as opposed to May when it usually is. 
Um, and so that made it into the statute. Uh, uh, and uh, it, didn't come, it didn't come to everybody's awareness until my opponent and I were all geared up and ready to run in May. And, uh, and when it did come to light, though, you know, the Secretary of State had to make a decision. She made a decision uh, strongly and quickly that we were going to run in November, like the statute uh, appeared to say. Uh, and I'm fine with that. I don't know that my opponent was fine with that, but I would have been happy to run whenever the Secretary of State and the court said, this is the election day. And so that's the kind of the history behind how we got there. And the way it sits uh, now, even though it was an unusual circumstance, we're running in November. And whichever my opponent or I gets more than 50% of the vote in, well, whichever one of us gets the most votes, wins in November. That'll, in November. It. Don't you ever run against me for labor commissioner. That's all I have to say about that. Pay the workers a fair wage and get the darn project going. We've got hundreds of people out of work up there that could be building that darn bridge. Let's get, get with it. That's what I say. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the acronym ALEC. It's been in the news lately, the conservative uh, lobbyists, uh, the Weezers and Dealers. Are you aware of any ALEC proposals that are made with respect to labor here in you know, I, I don't know I, I don't know of any in particular that Alec is pushing, but there are there are some very very damaging efforts going on in Oregon with regard to labor right now. Whether it's Alec or whatever conservative group is behind it, um, and just as an example, you all know the story of Wisconsin. All the union busting efforts in Wisconsin, some of it that made it into state law. Well, did you know that those Wisconsin bills were here in Oregon before our legislature? legislature? When I went down in 2011 to the legislature, I had two goals in mind. One of them was to pass that shop class bill. The other was to kill every single one of those Wisconsin union busting bills that were sponsored the chief sponsor of all of them, State Senator Bruce Starr. Well, we killed every one of those bills. So I guess Senator Starr thought that it was all right since he lost everything at the legislature he was trying to do to say, okay, well then I'm just going to go run against you, Brad, for labor commissioner and run the agency that exists to protect the workers, which is what he's done. But there's that. There are bills every time to uh, eat away at the minimum wage, to take away prevailing wage. Uh, it is a constant assault, uh, which frankly is why you need somebody in this position that is watching every single one of those bills and killing them every time they come up, and we've done that.
Wow. Um, you know, every agency in the state, almost every agency in the state is, is facing a similar thing to us in, in how we are going to accommodate the deep, deep budget cuts and continue fulfilling the mission of the agency. Our agency is a little different in, in that if you were to go back you know, a couple decades, we had 172 employees, which even at that is not a big state agency. We had 172. Um, today we have 101. We have lost a huge percentage of the agency. And I'm telling you, caseloads have not gone down. And the, the, uh, the amount of statutes, the jurisdiction that we have has expanded. And so when we talk about how we continue protecting workers, I'm telling you, we do a tremendous job of it. But we do it only because of the superhuman efforts of the investigators and the case presenters and the people who train employers at the agency. They're doing a monumental amount of work. Right now, we've got to go back to the e-board in May and make a pitch for them to have us not lose what could be up to about eight more positions. So if we lose those positions, the reality is that we might have to be making some very tough decisions about what wage and hour laws we are not going to enforce anymore. And you're right, those workers have nowhere to go but court, which means you're hiring a lawyer, you're paying court fees when you're out of work. The rea what it's going to mean is people aren't going to get the help. So. In the uh, 60s and 70s, I had uh, nieces, nephews, cousins, all picking in the fields at one time or another when they were kids. And that was standard in those days. Now, they were taken out of the fields. My understanding was it was over pesticides that were being used on the crops, and they did not want children exposed to that type of thing. Well, the type of pesticides they use now are considerably different from what they used in those days. I'm wondering if maybe that issue couldn't be examined again so, so that the kids would have that opportunity. Well, there's, there, there we still have, a, even with, with that and the restrictions on the number of hours you can work during a school year, there are still lots of ways to have young people working in the fields, and, and we still do. Well, I think the pesticide issue was part of it 30 and 40 years ago. The, now the, the issue really is um, you have a professional migrant workforce that knows its trade and produces at huge amounts for the same wages. And a lot of farmers, um, I think, have to now weigh, you know, do I want to take an adult professional workforce and replace it with, you know, 15-year-old kids again? And so there's something has stepped in to fill the void. Even with that, the farming community is very, very interested in keeping that culture of young people working. And under existing state law, I'm telling you, we can do it. see this kind of visionary thinking coming out of leaders. And I was wondering, are you working with other leaders to begin to try to articulate, as FDR did in New Deal, what the notion of the public good is and what the hell the culture is for in the first place? Well, the, the answer to your question is yes. And we, you know, we have, we have a remarkable um, bank of talent in Oregon and our public leaders, I think. Um, we're not always on the same page on every issue. Um, but just to give you an example of this, um, uh, the five statewide elected officials. And in Oregon, you know, we don't answer to the governor. Um, I'm, I am completely autonomous and separate from the governor. So is the Secretary of State. So is the Attorney General. We're all separately elected statewide officials. Uh, and so our agencies don't fall under the governor's umbrella. 
which makes it for an interesting kind of dynamic in making sure we're all working together with a common vision. Just one example that you might not know about, we get together and have lunch once a month, um, all your statewide officials. We sit down, we talk about issues, we talk about the, our visions, and every chance we get, we try and make sure our agencies are pointed in the same direction. And so uh, the answer is I think you can have a lot of faith that even though it doesn't work perfectly every time, there really is a terrific effort by your highest statewide officials uh, to make sure our visions are in common and we're being supportive of each other. It would be good if you communicated that more to us. Deal. Back here. Well, I'm a graduate of the School of Arts and Communications today. Really? Yeah, let's talk about credit, credit, the use of credit reports. But before I do that, since your alma mater is the Arts and Communications School, which um, is the school my son graduated from, too, so I know the school very, very well. Um, uh, let me say this. You know, it was, I, I've devoted so much of my time now because of my position and because it's the right thing to do to getting those shop classes back. But you know, the thing that first got me started in politics, the first time I ever ran for office, was when the Beaverton School District, because of budget cuts from the state, eliminated all of its elementary bands and orchestras. And I have been, even though I was the, by far, the worst clarinet player in my school <laughs> band, there was not a chair down the row far enough for me as, as a musician. But I understand the importance of it in the development of a human being. And the fact that we, it isn't just shop classes, we have stripped music and art and physical education, all the things that develop well-rounded children and well-rounded citizens later. That school devoted to music and art is, is, um, is, is uh, an exception. But now that we're getting the shop classes back, I'm not the state school superintendent, I'm the commissioner of labor and industries, but I'm telling you I am setting my sights now on getting music and art back into the public school system. Now, credit reporting. There was a law passed by the legislature a few years ago that precludes employers from using credit histories in their hiring and um, personnel decisions. And there are a few exceptions to that for industries where it's a necessary element, but the law right now is you can't do it in Oregon anymore. So if somebody's doing it, they're probably breaking the law and you need to call us. I just want to say, as a retired Army wife, that I thank you very much for your support of military spouses. Because even before the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, there would be sudden troop uh, movements where you had a couple of days to adjust the fact that your husband was leaving. And um, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for supporting military spouses. You bet. Uh, you know, the meal and rest period rules um, are so important. You got, to, the preface to the answer in your question is this. You've got to understand what a meal and rest period rule is for. It isn't just so somebody can get a break and do their job better. You know, they need nourishment. They need to rest their bodies, for sure. 
But the reason sometimes is so you're safe on the job, not just for yourself, but for the people that are working around you. So when, when we say you get your two breaks and you get your, your, your lunch break in the middle, it's not optional. It's not the employer gives you a time that you can take or leave, okay? You need to take the break by law. And it isn't just for your own self, it's for everybody who's working around you. That becomes incredibly important when you're working in a mill or when you're laying pavement on a road or doing something, or, or frankly, when you're, when you're working in a, in a hospital uh, or a school. All of these things have serious safety issues around them, and so, uh, no, you, you need to be provided and you need to take them. Yeah, I'm so glad you said it. You know, one of the great emerging industries in the country that I want Oregon to start being a little more forceful about getting is our jobs in the renewable energy industry. Yeah. You know, we have, we, have, we have got to grow a backbone here and go out and get those jobs because they are there. And I don't just mean building the, uh, building the wind turbine. I mean the manufacturing jobs that provide component parts that go out all over the world that are being built in other states and in Germany right now and in the Asian countries. 60%, this is why what you said is so important, we anticipate that 60% of the jobs, the emerging new jobs in this industry can be performed with a high school degree. So you have a series of shop classes that teach you a little bit about metal work, a little bit about manufacturing. You can step out into a living wage job in this industry. And you never know if it was there for you. Yeah. You, you wouldn't, and I'll bet you that your husband could, would be a great testament to this. You know, we only have uh, about 60% of our high school kids in Oregon right now that graduate on time in four years. Close to 90% if you had exposure to career education. It's better for the kid, it's better for business both. It is a win everywhere around. So I think that was the last question. I just want to thank you again so much for having me out. I'll be here anytime you like. Well, let me first of all issue an apology to Peter Brown. Uh, the vice chair of the American Kind of Dems, the power behind the throne, right here, our own Peter Brown. I see our Marion County clerk, uh, Bill Burgess, has uh, joined us. Bill, welcome once again. Do we have any announcements that need to be made? Yes, Rick. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Brad, for, uh, for coming and uh, you are a true, uh, one of our, our treasured public officials, and um, it's our job as reasonable people in this state to make sure that he gets reelected in the fall. Um, th there's nothing worse than having a uh, labor commissioner who's hell bent on destroying l labor. <laughs> And, uh, and, and gutting civil rights uh, issues. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to point out that uh, a couple of things. First of all, we in the Marion County Dems are, are, are very, very active. We've done a lot of work to, uh, um, to create a mission statement, goals, and action items that support those goals. And uh, we have distributed all those action items among our committees, and we really encourage you to uh, get involved with that because uh, there's nothing worse than a bunch of people getting burned out because they, we have the vision but we, we you know, our, our bodies are weak. Uh, type A personalities with type B bodies, you know. <laughs> uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Andy Bromlin, our, our program uh, chair who's in, our, who is responsible for this. 
and uh, all of our programs. And also, it was just his birthday, so you may want to wish him a happy birthday. Um, now, mine's coming up in another uh, less than two weeks, so. Yeah, keep in mind. Um, so, uh, we have. Um, we have the vision, we need some more bodies to help us with the vision, but we also need financial support. We are the envy of the state for our facility we have downtown at 250 Liberty Street uh, Southeast, but we really need to be able to fund that facility and our major fundraiser is coming up on May 18th. And if you, uh, uh, you know, if you, liked uh, hearing from Brad Avakian, which how could you not? Uh, he will be there as our featured speaker there. <laughs> we have uh, registration forms here for those in attendance and for those of you on CCTV, go to www.MarionDemocrats.org uh, and you can fill out the, uh, the, the form, uh, download the form and, and send it in. Uh, we really need to, um, we need this funding. This is our major fundraiser, and we hope that you all can be there. I will be standing at the door here and checking all of you before you leave. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for, uh, for supporting us, and thank you, Brad, again for coming. Hi, I'm Wanda Davis. Wow, that's tall. I'm Wanda Davis. I'm uh, Vice Chair of Polk County Dems, and I just wanted to let you all know our next meeting on May 3rd at the uh, Polk County Courthouse, we're going to have several very special guest speakers, and I thought some of you all might want to come out and uh, enjoy that. We have um, Jen Gaddis, who's running for Polk County District Attorney. We have um, Jennifer Wheeler, who is running in the first election since we've made the, um, the county commissioner's race nonpartisan, uh, she'll be there to speak. We also have Nina Cook, who is running for state Supreme Court, and Ellen Rosenblum running for attorney general. So if anybody wants to come out and meet those ladies, we're gonna have about an hour where they each get to speak. And um, it's kind of a women's candidate forum, so come on out. Thank you. And let me just, in, in conclusion, say that uh, one of the most important things that I heard the commissioner say was a little bit that he said about his opponent and what the record of Senator Starr happens to be. Uh, if ever there was a dark Vader, uh, <laughs> this is an important election. On the one hand, we have somebody who's been a champion of labor, who's uh, walked the talk, not just talked the talk, on one side, and that's Commissioner Avakian. And the other side would take apart the very protections that we hold so high in this state. So once again, thank you, Commissioner, for being here today, and good luck in the election. And we are adjourned.